Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the presentation of the report of the Media Freedom Rapid Response Mission on the safety of journalists here in the Netherlands. This press conference will be done in English because uh, the mission was conducted by an international coalition, and we also have an international audience mainly online. Media Freedom Rapid Response is a co consortium of six European media and press freedom organizations. I will all name them. So we start with the European Center for Press and Media Freedom, the European Feder uh, Federation of Journalists, Article 19, International Press Institute, the Osservatorio Balconi e Crocoso Trans Europa, Italian, Italian, and Free Press Unlimited. The Media Freedom Rapid Response is funded by the European Commission and its objective is to give legal and practical support to journalists in the member countries and candidate countries of the Union. The consortium monitors press freedom in these countries and undertakes also advocacy to strive for more and better press freedom and the safety of journalists. Um, the MFRR already conducted several missions in other countries, so the Netherlands is not the first. Uh, other countries where the mission was taking place was uh, Poland, uh, Slovenia, Hungary, Italy and Serbia. So now you might ask, why the Netherlands? Because the Netherlands, of course, has a very good reputation when it comes to the safety of journalists. It is known as a front fighter for press freedom. And internationally, it stands for a safe haven for journalists. And uh, a well-known new initiative called Pers Veilig, which is actually an agreement between the Dutch Association of Journalists, the Dus Dutch Soci Society of Editors-in-Chief, and on the other side, the police and the public prosecution has also a very good name internationally. So why then a mission here in the Netherlands? Because sadly, despite being a front fighter for press freedom, here in the Netherlands, we also face increasingly violations and a hostile climate against journalists. We all remember the decision of the Dutch public broadcaster to remove the logos from their transportation vehicles, right? To actually protect their employees. And of course, we remember the horrible murder on the Dutch crime journalist Peter Ede Vries on broad daylight. But we also see an increasingly violation against journalists during demonstrations, even peaceful demonstrations. Pers Veilig also monitors a lot of these alerts. And in 2021, they filed 270 alerts. Intimidation, violation, harassment, all against journalists. That number was in 2020 only 121. So there's a steep increase. And the question is, of course, why? Why is the safety of journalists here in the Netherlands declining in practice? Because on paper, we have such a strong safety mechanism, like Pers Veilig. To find that answer, that was the reason why we, Free Press Unlimited, initiated this fact-finding mission in the Netherlands. We did that in a very close consultation with the Dutch Association of Journalists. And as soon as we announced this, we got a lot of reactions. There's a huge interest for this. For this particular mission, we interviewed a wide range of stakeholders, varying from, of course, journalists and editors in chiefs, but also policymakers, uh, member of parliaments, um, and of course, the coordinator of Pers Veilig. And the results of the investigation are to be found in this report, which will be presented in just a couple of minutes. And the report is named Spotlight 
on safety, advancing protection for journalists amidst rising threats here in the Netherlands. The report, uh, the main results of the report will be presented by Laurens Hutting from the European Centre of Press and Media Freedom and Guusje Sommer of Free Press Unlimited. And after their presentation, there will be two panels who will go into the recommendations of the report. One um, will look into the prevention and strategies with a specific gender lens, and the other panel will go into the protection of journalists. I hope that you have a very interesting afternoon, and I wish you all the best. Guusje and Laurens, can I give you the floor? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Um, and thank you all for being here to start with. Uh, a real thank you, because I think the fact that we are here today with such a wide range of actors, uh, ranging from the policymakers, politicians, to, of course, the journalistic community, editors in chief, but also uh, law enforcement and academic experts is really uh, something that should not be taken for granted, uh, especially when looking at what is happening in Russia today, for instance, where journalists are like, of course, there's there is no journalism left. Um, a meeting that we are having today would be absolutely impossible. And that's an understatement, I think. So to start with, uh, thank you for showing up today and to, for um, uh, showing your support for the safety of journalists uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, in this regard, um, I think the Netherlands is clearly a very safe haven uh, for journalists. Uh, that being said, let us now zoom into um, uh, the, the safety of journalists in the Netherlands. So at the center of um, the Dutch policy regarding safety of journalists is persveilig, or in English, press safe. I think for the audience here in the room, uh, this is already quite um, known, but we also have an uh, international audience online. So just to briefly explain, um, persveilig is a safety mechanism, including several protocols, um, uh, national action plans uh, and guidelines. Uh, and it was established in 2019 by the National Police, as Ruth said, uh, the Dutch Journalist Union, uh, the Association of Editors-in-Chief and the Public Prosecution Office. And it is co-funded by uh, several ministries of the Dutch government. So in that regard, um, Persveilig is a very unique uh, safety mechanism um, that's also internationally often praised. So to begin with, in our report, what we found is that the symbolic value of per Persveilig is very high. So um, an example is the Persveilig hotline, where journalists who uh, are faced with harassment, uh, intimidation, violence, uh, and other forms of press freedom violations can uh, file a report. And this gives a very clear signal to society that no press freedom violation, uh, violation should ever be accepted in the Netherlands, and also that this is not part of the job of journalists. Um, but this hotline also means that data are collected at a central point uh, and that press freedom violations in the Netherlands are now being monitored consistently. Uh, so this has shown an increase in the past year, for instance, um, of threats against journalists. And we see that this has clearly led to more awareness on the policy level. And in that sense, we uh, conclude in our report that Persveilig has really strengthened the voice of journalists uh, towards the authorities. But of course, Persveilig also leads to uh, more practical improvements of safety of journalists on the ground. So in the mission, uh, in the meetings that we had as part of the mission, what came forward very often was the example of the safety trainings that are offered by Persveilig. So these are basically trainings offered to uh, reporters, journalists, but also photographers and also offered to freelancers uh, for free um, to basically prepare them for the potential violence that they may face while reporting, uh, for instance, on demonstrations. So it is a way to make them more resilient and to teach them coping strategies. And this in our mission really came forward as one of the, um, uh, well, it's very, very much appreciated by the journalistic community and also serves as an example for other um, countries, we think. But at the same time, we're of course not here today just to praise Pers Veilig, but um, we also need to zoom out a bit and uh, look at room um, for improvement, of course, in the Dutch, generally in the Dutch policy regarding safety of journalists. And we're also here today to provide some recommendations. Um, and despite the persveilig efforts, we cannot ignore the fact that, as Ruth also said, um, threats and aggression against journalists are and remain on the rise in the Netherlands. So this, in fact, has led us to believe that 
prosecuting the aggressors of journalists and at the same time um, improving coping strategies of journalists to deal with harassment that they face is just simply not enough. So to remain an international pioneer, the Netherlands really need to do more about preventing these threats against journalists. And the Netherlands need to do more in order to address the root causes underlying such threats and such aggression. So first is will we think require a more investigation, more research into the motives that people hold. Like why do people harass journalists? Why do people think it is okay to um, to throw uh, to throw eggs at reporters at demonstrations? Uh, what are the underlying root causes? And I think following from that. Um, Policy is needed to improve the position of journalists in the Dutch society and to really strengthen their role uh, and also the perception of the role of journalists as a fourth pillar uh, in our democracy. Um, so in, that's why we uh, recommend to the Dutch authorities in particular, uh, the Ministry of Education, Culture and Justice, uh, to explore this option further. And we hope that today, uh, the first panel of today will uh, be a first um, exploration of that uh, recommendation. But first, Lawrence will uh, share a bit more. Thanks, Fuchsia. Um, so I'll address uh, four further key action points that came out of our fact finding. They are uh, firstly about gender, secondly the need for uh, advancing tailor-made protection options uh, to tackle threats uh, coming from organized crime. The third one is about policing protest and lastly also the need to preserve and expand the capacity of Pechsveilig. Um, so the first action point concerns the need for specific policies that will improve the safety of women journalists. Uh, throughout the mission, we heard the, from our interlocutors that uh, women journalists face specific types of threats and are also more frequently subjected to attacks in specific contexts, um, online context being an, an important one here. Um, the Netherlands, in other words, is no exception to um, European and global trends in, in this regard. Um, at the same time, establishing the scope and the intensity of the problem here in the Netherlands proved, uh, proved challenging, as there is currently no systematic systemic monitoring mechanism that tracks this gendered and gender-based violence and harassment. Um, we're concerned about this blind spot. Um, first, because there is a blind spot and that that's a problem in se, but also um, because of the impact or the implication that having this blind spot has in, on uh, the development of policies. Uh, creating solutions that work after all uh, really requires a precise understanding of the problem. Um, and so that's why one of our recommendations is that uh, monitoring of attacks and harassment of women journalists specifically should be strengthened. One possible solution uh, could be to integrate this into Pex Veilig's uh, alert mechanism, which at the moment does not collect data about the gender of the affected journalist. The second action point um, concerns the need to accelerate the development of tailor-made protection for journalists who face threats coming from organized crime. Um, we heard during the mission that the, the threat from the underworld must be taken more seriously uh, and the, that the current approach is too naive. Uh, the word kinderachtig or childish uh, came up repeatedly during, during our interviews. Um, at the same time, it's clear that not all journalists who face si the same or similar threats um, either require or want the same format and the same type of protection. Um, so there needs to be a move away from a cookie cutter approach into something that is tailored and fits each journalist's individual situation. Uh, in any case, whatever the shape that this protection then takes, uh, it must allow a reporter to continue working, which, um, especially for, for crime journalists, um, a key point here is the protection of their sources um, uh, as they are in contact with people who may not be too keen on that meeting being joined by a police officer as well, for example. <laughs> Um, thirdly, uh, I wanted to briefly address the interaction between reporters and police during protests. Um, many journalists told us that in recent years uh, tension has increased. This is despite a very high willingness uh, for cooperation between the various actors. Uh, but nevertheless, there remains a need to uh, ensure a better understanding of the role of the press during demonstrations. Uh, at the moment, we, our understanding is that a lack of capacity uh, seems to be part of the explanation of, of the problem. Um, this increased understanding then 
should also translate into um, changes to operational procedures with a view to minimizing interference and obstruction of reporting during, during demonstrations. Uh, this ought to include, among other things, um, improvement of the practice around the recognition of the press card. Um, lastly, the, the final action point I, I wanted to raise before handing it over to, to our panelists is the capacity of Pace Veilig. Um, with this mechanism, the Netherlands has really created uh, a rare gem of best practice if you look at the, the European context. And so now it's important the, to keep this European leadership, as, as Hushu also mentioned. Um, so with that in mind, the, the Media Freedom Rapid Response recommends um, further investment in, in this mechanism and in its resources. Um, this should include the full financing of the mechanism in the, the post-subsidy era um, and uh, also an expansion of, of its human capital, uh, its human resources, uh, so that the mechanism can respond on the one hand to the, the, the increase in threats that are currently within its scope, but also can broaden that scope to include, for example, uh, a gender lens or to um, uh, invest more in, in prevention. Um, I'll keep it at this and hand it over to our moderator. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so it is now time to uh, dive a little deeper into some of the recommendations that we just heard. Um, and we will do that through two panels. As Ruth briefly mentioned, um, the first panel will focus on prevention strategies of women journalists, and the second panel will focus on the safety of journalists during demonstrations and in the context of organized crime. My name is Flora schulten nortold and I will be moderating both panels. Um, I'd like to invite the first panel up uh, on stage, Ingrid and Rowan. While you're walking up, I will uh, briefly introduce who I have with, with me here on stage. Um, Rowan Bleit, oh, <laughs> introducing each other. Um, Rowan Bleit, program maker for Caro NCRV and founder of The Glow Up. Welcome. Um, and Ingrid Michon, Dutch member of parliament of the VVD party and spokesperson on justice and security. We had a third panelist who unfortunately was sick today from the Ministry uh, of Education, but I'm certain that we will have enough valuable insights with these two panelists today. Um, so welcome. I have some questions for us to start off the discussion. And after that, uh, at the end of this panel, there will be room for questions from the audience. Uh, so I'd like to ask you to save your questions till the end, please. Uh, and for those watching uh, through live stream, you can pose your questions in the chat and we will um, get to those at the end as well. Uh, Rowan, let's start with you. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the <clears throat> findings from the report is that women journalists in the Netherlands uh, face more online, uh, more threats and violence uh, than their male colleagues, especially online. Um, you are a female journalist. Uh, do you agree? Is this something uh, that you experience as well? Um, I wholeheartedly agree. The thing is that it always was a feeling or I heard my other female colleagues uh, talk about it, talk about the threats that they receive. Um, but I, um, um, I'm glad that we're now getting to the step that we are um, going to collect data to back that feeling up. So I wholeheartedly agree that we as female journalists um, have a very hard time doing our jobs mm -hmm. because we get critiqued for uh, not only doing our jobs, but also for who we are or where we are from. So it's um, it gets very personal very easily. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that uh, that you that it's good to know you didn't just imagine it. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are the? I'm just gonna have one follow up question for you. What are the effects of this violence in your work? Do you uh, self censor, for example, or how do you? How does it affect your day to day work? Um, for me, for example, I, um, back in 2017, have received a lot of threats for um, something very, like, I thought it was very fun and light lighthearted. Um, but for me personally, when I received those threats and all those messages, um, I really uh, thought about the possibility of possibly leaving this job and do something else or not be on the forefront as much or um, not tell the stories that I'm uh, used to tell. Um, yeah. So that's, that was it for me. That's a huge effect yeah. for, uh, for a journalist, of course. 
Um, Ingrid, a uh, question for you. Um, so next to specific recommendations on safety of women journalists, uh, prevention was also a big theme in the report uh, that needed improvement in the Netherlands. Um, and we know that the Fever Day uh, puts a quite strong emphasis on prosecution and uh, stronger punishment. Mm -hmm. What is the vision of the Fever Day in terms of um, prevention? Yeah, well, I uh, thank you and thank you for having me here. It's a very interesting afternoon and a, a good initiative. And I think that uh, prevention and the pres the prosecution has to be it's both sides on one medal. So you can't only focus on prevention mm -hmm. without sort of keeping the door closed. Um, so we did a lot of initiatives like uh, there's one initiative called Doxing. That's a new law which... Um, which tries to um, sort of cope with threatening on the internet. So like uh, if you, example, mm -hmm. see your name or you see your your address, uh, it, it can be very threatening to uh, put it online. But of course, prevention, in my point of view, is starts with sort of drawing the line. Even in, in Parliament, where I am, if you see my colleagues uh, talking about mainstream ma media or uh, they're sort of encouraging people who um, who are not dealing with the law we got here, then I think it's very important as a member of parliament that you stand up and you you speak up, you speak out for uh, our journalists. And that's what we do as a favor day. Yeah, um, yeah, drawing the line and, and pinpointing what it is that we're dealing with is super important, of course. Do you link that to some sort of education uh, programs in terms of prevention? Well, for me, journalism is, is a very important uh, pillar on the whole, the whole house we build in Holland on our democracy and our rule of law. Mm -hmm. So... In, the, in that way, yes, of course, it is education. We got like, uh, it's very important to uh, sort of, yeah, sort of um, yeah, be careful with the institutions we have. And I think journalism is a very important sort of institution in the whole house of democracy, in the whole house of rule of law that we got here in this country. Uh, and, and yeah, in that way, it's, of course, it starts with education, yes. Yeah. Definitely. And uh, just to say with you for one follow up question, uh, specifically because we're talking about women journalists here. Um, do you have a uh, policy or policy ideas to better protect women journalists specifically? Actually, no, no. That's, I heard this uh, uh, today in this report and it's very important to set the agenda and I, to hear it from you. And as a female politician, I think, uh, yeah, we, we, I think we got some uh, same experiences. Um, so I think it's very, very important to set the agenda and to see what's specially needed for female journalists. I, d I even think that there are not so, so many female journalists, are there? Oh, Much no, there are. no, there are lots of female journalists yeah. and women journalists. Yes, yes, there are. And um, uh, that's why I also think that in that respect that we really need to monitor the data. Yeah. And we really need to um, um, count and, and not count women out because that's what, mm. uh, what we have been doing for a long time. Um, and also not count their experiences out. As well, no, yeah, but yeah. yeah. that's no, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. And I think now that there's so much attention on like being a woman and the gender-based aspect of violence, as you say, Ingrid, uh, politicians and journalists are quite close to each other. They're both in the spotlight, mm -hmm. both quite vulnerable. Um, yeah. So it's it's yeah, it's good to address that group um, as such. Yeah. Um, Rowan, you are hearing just now in the recommendations by Grisha and Lawrence, and right now in this conversation quite some recommendations <clears throat> and ideas about you and your work. Um, hearing this, do you think this will help or? Mm, yes, of course. No, no, I, I really do think um, um, the four points that were already made uh, do help. Um, and I do hope that um, uh, we can stick to it, uh, mm -hmm. that it will, that we can keep it top of mind as well. Um, and uh, my thing really is to uh, 
to monitor the data, to have some data, to have something to grasp, uh, to inform policies, to inform uh, inform research, further research. I mean, um, so I hold, I agree with uh, what has already been said. Yeah, a lack of data is uh, mm. is of course a huge issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's good that that's a recommendation um, in the report. Um, Ingrid, to ha ask you a follow up question. Um, what do you think is the responsibility of other stakeholders? So we're talking about journalists here. Um, but as you said, you have the doxing law um, mm -hmm. and platforms are involved there. Newsrooms are involved. They probably have a duty of care for their journalists. Mm -hmm. Where does the responsibility lie f towards other stakeholders, do you feel? Like, like others, others. So, other, so the platforms, um, what do you uh, feel that platforms, for example, should... Uh, Okay. Do you feel they have a responsibility in this regard? Well, I think it's I think it's a common responsibility because we this problem is is much bigger than you can cope alone. Mm -hmm. Unless a journalist, uh, mm -hmm. the community of journalists yeah. cannot cope cannot do it alone. So I think it's that's why Persveilig they stood up. That's why uh, members of parliaments uh, and also of course the ministries they sort of um, want to. Uh, cooperate with Persveilig and they want to, uh, yeah, they want they want to fund it, and I think uh, that's a very good initiative because then there you see uh, problems in a whole, so not like mm -hmm. like divided, but the whole problem, uh, and I think it's very important that uh, Persveilig, uh, that's one one of the uh, action uh, as well, that Persveilig will continue and and uh, will maybe increase also their um, their um, attention, for example, for fe female journalism, um, because that's the beginning of the discussion. And the discussion then starts not only in parliament, but also just in society yep. and on the ministries, mm -hmm. like, what do we think is normal? What is needed to protect our journalists? And that can be, yeah. like, as a member of parliament, it's always about, well, sort of measures to protect them. For example, the funding... Uh, we we do it with persveilig the funding um so every journalist who has not an employer can can follow courses or they can have a, a red button to protect yeah. themselves so that's like small measures to um make their work in a, in a safer environment but yeah. it's like so much more so i think it's very important to um to cooperate and to do it together with every stakeholder. Yeah. Because I think in society and in parliament and on the ministries, everybody agrees that we have to be very careful and we have to stand up for our journalists. So yeah. um, in that way, there's not much uh, difference of understanding. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I hear you. And we need a multi-stakeholder approach is what I'm hearing yeah. in your answer, yeah. definitely. Um, I'm seeing some questions coming through the chat, which is a nice bridge for a question to you, Rowan. Um, journalists, journalists themselves, of course, are also stakeholder here. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is the role of journalism or a journalist itself to protect specifically mm. women journalists in this case mm, it's a they have a very big role to um, um, have this infrastructure or a safety net available for their own journalists um, that um, uh, might have some harassment issues uh, issues uh, coming towards them uh, for example when I faced um, uh, my sort of harassments back in uh, back in 2017 it was very hard for me to um, find uh, the right path within the company to see who could help me, who could support me. Yeah. Um, the uh, main re reaction that I got from colleagues was, it's part of the job. Yeah. That's just that's yeah. just what happens. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't enough for me. So what happened afterwards for me was that I joined the uh, Association of uh, Journalists. Um, so that was what I did. But I think that uh, the, the, the public broadcasting system that we have, um, that there are lots of steps available. For example, um, in other countries, all, uh, they also have examples ready um, for what you can do to support your um, journalists. I mm -hmm. think a safety net in the form of even asking, how are you? How is this affecting you? That's a small step that you could even undertake. Um, but there are lots of other things that um, they can do. And I think it's very important to realize as a broadcaster, for example, I, I'm using my own example, um, to realize the role that you have in supporting your own journalists. And I, yeah. I, I hope that um, with everything that's uh, happening right now, that uh, the realization um, 
is 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 there right now that's what i hope yeah yeah so this attitude of it's part of the job that's yeah. of course a deeper rooted um issue it's a more systemic issue that we need a culture change in some exactly. way to view positions of journalists yes uh, just one follow up question about the, this network that you're talking about do you feel um supported enough by existing networks or do you feel that there really is an area of improvement there uh, for a whole new network to be set up um i think there is room for um um uh, how do you say that for um an extra network you could say okay. i think our approach has been very broad in the netherlands it has been very um uh, we can help journalists mm -hmm. as a whole but um as we already heard before we really need some gender based studies and a gender based approach for women uh, journalists uh, in this example because they um get a different type of threats than male journalists get. So I really think that um, if I think of my own examples, if I think of the friends I have that work in journalism, the approach that we need is um, very different towards us than towards men. And yeah. I think um, there's a whole lot of work to do in that ex uh, aspect still. Yeah, recognizing these attacks as gender-based, there's a huge gender component because mm -hmm. the attacks are often, same as politicians, sexual, uh, misogynistic, and it really needs to be um, recognized as such. Uh, Ingrid, did you want to respond just yeah, now? Well, uh, after that, I'm going to look to the audience if there are any questions uh, left. I think I think it's, of course, it's important to... Um, uh, To, to to tell about it in your own company and you have your 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 boss you are, have an employer but there are a lot of journalists freelancers and they are on their own mm -hmm. uh, so I think for that specific group then pers veilig but also like uh, every every uh, police every region police region got his own uh, single point of contact especially for journalists who are threatened who, who are uh, dealing with harassment so I think um Yeah, even for the freelance journal journalism, they can feel more sort of in isolation and more alone. Even uh, people working in an in an in an um, yeah. in an uh, public, but yeah, uh, company, public company, public, yeah, yeah. Uh, public broadcaster. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. These this group of freelancers as extra yeah. vulnerable mm -hmm. actually yeah. to these attacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm looking at the time and looking into the audience. Are there any questions here from this group? No. Um, then I think in terms of time, it goes very fast. Yeah. Uh, we're going to need to round off unless one of you has a last remark to, uh, I think make one, to round off. one last thing that I really want to point out mm -hmm. is that, um, for in gender based violence in uh, politics, in uh, media, in uh, whatever, I think it's also very important in le legislation, legislation, yeah. I mean, that the correct training is available as well for officers, for yeah. Um, uh, lawyers, for example, because what we see in gender-based violence in, as a whole is that it's very hard sometimes for women to step up and to say what's happening. Um, so I would also suggest looking at that. Yes, yeah. strong point to end yes. this panel yeah. with, I think. Thank you. Uh, thank you both so much for uh, joining us today here. Thank you. Um, thank, you. thank you. And I'd like to invite the second panel up, but perhaps first a round of applause for this uh, panel. Thank you. The second panel, um, while you walk up here, I will introduce you. Um, so in the second panel, we will focus on another major theme in the report. Um, the safety of journalists during demonstrations and in the context of organized crime. And with us here today, we have, starting on my right, your left, uh, Paul Fucht, investigative crime journalist for Parole. We have Thomas Bruning, General Secretary from the Dutch Association of Journalists, and we have Peje de May, Head of Operations at the Dutch Police. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, Paul, I'll start with you. Um, so the uh, murder of Peter R. de Vries uh, sparked a nationwide discussion on the safety of journalists and more specifically on personal protection of journalists. Um, and one of the re recommendations in the report uh, was this tailor-made personal protection. And given your experience with personal protection, uh, what is your view on this Uh, I think it's very important because um, the protection being tailor-made is is the most important uh, about the whole uh, um, complex of uh, protection. I've been um, 
Uh, they plan to kill me in uh, 2017, and I've been in the best protection we have in Holland, uh, um, the, the Royal Diplomatic uh, Security Service, Dienst Koninklijke en Diplomatieke Beveiliging. Uh, that's top of the bill. Uh, so I've, uh, we lived in a safe house, my girlfriend and I, and I was um, with them. And they protected me all uh, to all the places at all the places where we uh, went. But if it's if you get one step lower or aside, uh, whoever you. Why, whatever you would call it, it's going to be um, uh, more critical because if you, uh, my uh, tailor-made uh, package was uh, 100% uh, the way I wanted it to have it uh, because uh, my, uh, the person uh, I, I dealt with, I spoke with, uh, uh, always the same person, we were uh, absolutely, um, we, we shared thoughts uh, and uh, that is a big issue in some other parts of uh, the Netherlands, and it's a big issue that uh, um, as the higher you you get into uh, uh, to the Hague, um, the the distance is is uh, um, too wide, it's too long. Uh, you need you need someone. Uh, really close to you. Uh, so I live in Amsterdam. I I really needed someone in Amsterdam uh, who I could talk to, who I can go to, who I can meet whenever I uh, want. And uh, once I need to go from Amsterdam to The Hague, uh, to, for example, NCTV, mm -hmm. um, uh, the contra-terror organization, who gets involved, that this is, is too long. You, you are not on speaking terms with the same persons uh, uh, the whole day, the whole week, and that's very important. So, sorry, just to clarify for those who are not very into the, this mm -hmm. matter, um, you you mean the higher in The Hague, uh, so the higher up in hierarchy, for example, yes. at the NCTV? Yes. Uh, and you had good personal protection because of the proximity? Short distance. Yeah, proximity. Okay. And why did you get this personal protection? And uh, One what, what, what made your case special like one stay. specific uh, crime group uh, uh, wanted to kill me yeah. uh, and it was the, the information was very specific yeah. um, and if I uh, wouldn't have been in protection I wouldn't have lived uh, so yeah. that was very specific yeah. uh, my colleague Sean van der Heuvel uh, working for the Telegraph as everybody knows he's in the same kind of protection from uh, December 2017 up until now yeah. uh, we have lawyers in the same kind of uh, protection yeah. uh, unfortunately uh, and we have uh, well, prosecutors and uh, judges uh, being secured that way uh, so that's the new reality we need to face and mm -hmm. uh, i don't want anybody to say it's not dutch way um, it's the dutch threat it's a threat for us in holland as well yeah. it's yeah. not italy it's us yeah it's it's the reality uh, it's in our the reality now. daily um, one quick follow-up question before I move on to uh, not the next panelist. Um, personal protection, of course, uh, requires a careful balance between journalistic freedoms on the one hand and safety on the other hand, um, which is always kind of the clash, right? Yes. So how do you think uh, this balance is best protected? Uh, in my personal story, it was... Uh, the only group I could not meet uh, easily was the criminals themselves okay. because the security service uh, wouldn't bring me to them uh, because they <laughs> were to me. But I need Good them call, as sources. Probably. <laughs> I need, but, but I still need them as sources. I need to, sp to be able to speak to everybody. So that, that, was, yeah. that we had work to do. I was the first journalist in Holland uh, in this protection uh, program. So we were pioneers in, uh, uh, in that. And we found out, I, I can't tell how, but we, we, we find out, find yeah. a, found a way to do it. But um, in general, um, the um, Royal and Diplomatic Security Service uh, made it possible for me to meet uh, whoever I want to okay. meet. Um, you have no privacy, you have no, uh, your agenda uh, needs to be on, on their side four uh, days before. Uh, so you have no, um, it's, um, it's not an easy way of living, <laughs> no. but they made me. Uh, they made it possible for me to do my job. Good, yeah. So um, it seems really seems there is an added value uh, to this tailor-made uh, personal yes, it's, protection, it's, as you say. It's crucial. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Thomas. I have a question for you. Um, Persveilig, uh, of which you are on the steering committee, um, is the mechanism in the Netherlands when it comes to the safety of journalists uh, and the demand is high. Uh, at the same time, the ministry has uh, announced that it will stop its funding per 2024, if I'm correct. 
so a more general question um, for you, what does the future of Pers Veilig look like? Where do you see Pers Veilig in five years? Well, I'm, I'm happy with this meeting and I'm also happy with, uh, well, this sort of positive European audit of what we're doing with Pers Veilig until now. And, um, but uh, to be honest, uh, the fact you, the, the point you're making is giving us some sort of worry because uh, as we experienced until now, um, it's crucial at one hand that uh, the sector itself, the media companies, the public broadcaster and, and, the, and the commercial broadcasters are, uh, are joining uh, forces also in a financial, giving financial means to support Pers Veilig. But we also experience that it's really necessary to have a, a public support as well. Mm -hmm. And what we emphasized uh, the last few years, and, and happily the, uh, the members of parliament and the ministers uh, supported this as well, is that we said, if you want to do a project like this, you need a sort of structural base. Otherwise, it becomes a project and you, you have to send away the people involved with it yeah. uh, uh, after three years or two years and you get this whole system again and our experiences with other types of uh well let's say things that the media party should do together like the ethical council mm. uh, uh, has given us reason to not only be uh positive about uh the support the serious uh, financial support from the from the sector itself. So until now, I, especially the public broadcaster showed that they want to invest, uh, but it's also a little bit um, uh, due to the fact that uh, one of the other members of the steering committee uh, of Pers Veilig is Marcel Gelauf, who's in, in, in the room here and who has good connections to the, to the public broadcaster. But we experienced, for instance, that the, the, the media companies, uh, let's say more the publishing side, have showed some uh, uh well uh, we had to convince them really about this project and i think we need to sort of join forces to to continue this project because it won't go away from itself and, yeah uh, yeah so uh yeah so you can rely on some sort of support from the sector itself that's good to hear um and we can expect pers veilig to not vanish in five years if uh, all goes well um, I do have a question. So you, you, you're talking about this financial support from the sector. Um, from the sector itself, do you think, and this is a question that also came in, by the way, uh, do you think there's a role or responsibility for journalists themselves in, term of their own in terms of their own safety? And um, if so, what do you think that is? Well, definitely. And one of the things I thought would could also be a recommendation would be the... the, the this, let's say, unstable position of freelance uh, journalist here in Holland. Yeah. Here, here. Um, uh, because I think, and I've said it here in, in the parliament as well, uh, in, in earlier meetings, that I uh, that to be a professional journalist, uh, you have to have the means also yourself to protect yourself. And what one of the outcomes, what we see, and I think it was mentioned in the report as well, is that, for instance, photojournalist or, or freelance journalist, they although they get offered these trainings for free mm -hmm. and these trainings usually would cost five six hundred euros a day they still would uh, cancel in the last moment because they say okay we can earn 300 euros today yeah. so we won't do it because we need the money and this is only one example and one of the others is of course that that usually freelancers aren't able to hire a, a special place to work and so they're working from out of their house yeah what may, which makes them also more vulnerable, and 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 the same goes for let's say the the bulletproof vest or or uh, uh, other sources of protection. It's quite worrisome if you have to think about these things. Yeah. Uh, uh, and at the same time, being a professional, and and, and last last week we were in in another uh, we were at the court, because and and we also mentioned this problem because, if, for instance, photo uh, photographers. They work not on an hourly base for media companies, but they work on a basis of uh, giving uh, giving them Project, a, yeah, a, yeah. A, per photo. Eh? Mm -hmm. They get paid per photo. But if you go to some tense demonstration or some you know uh, places where you, in fact, you have to invest first, you know, to be safe, 
you have to place your car uh, not directly on yeah. the demonstration. You have to, uh, it would be f much more better not to bring your camera directly, you know, so you can connect with the people and see how your position is. But if you get paid by photo, it's not easy to make yeah. this decision because you, you have to do it in your own time. So yeah, thank yeah, thank you. I'm hearing I'm hearing this these struggles or these issues around freelance journalists. Um, Bay, I want to ask you a question, but I want to give Paul one chance to react uh, to the freelance issue, if you like. Um, uh, same as I Thomas, heard you. I've, uh, uh, I've been uh, stressing this point uh, yeah. for for years now uh, because um, I work for a big publishing company, uh, so uh, from my costs were were paid uh, very well with without hesitate. Uh, but uh, my uh, work uh, colleagues who we work freelance, they sometimes need to think twice or uh, or longer uh, if they are gonna uh, put uh, one or another story out uh, because with the risk of uh, being uh, harassed uh, or uh, even killed or mm -hmm. um, um, accused in court uh, and need to pay a lawyer uh, and this chilling effect is a big, big danger to uh, yeah. the freedom of press. Yeah, yeah. This uh, it, it is a vulnerable group, what we heard in the first panel, and now uh, it's reiterated again. Um, Baya, to uh, include you in the conversation now, um, one of the recommendations in the report is uh, that there's more need for police capacity. Um, and what do you think is needed to better implement the Persveilig protocol within the police? Yeah, uh, every problem uh, in the world, uh, the answer is more police. Uh, <laughs> it's not. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I think uh, we're always uh, short on, uh, on budget and, and uh, policemen, of course. But um, I think uh, it's a very serious problem that we have here uh, on our hands. Uh, and I think the report um, uh, and also this conversation uh, that realize the police that we have to do more than, uh, than we do now. I think Persveilig is a, is a very good start eh? because we all in, in this room realize uh, and we experience all uh, these attacks. Eh? Uh, it's, it's indeed uh, uh, a fact of life now. There's, uh, science, uh, members of parliament, uh, journalists and also policemen, they are attacked in their work. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's not acceptable. So I think the most important statement that we have to make here is uh, society should not accept this. Yeah. And of course, we are, as a police, the last resort, but we are not the solution to every problem. Uh, and I think in Persveilig, there, there is an understanding that uh, journalists first have to protect themselves, the companies are responsible, and there is a last resort, and that's the police. And I think it's very important uh, as... as uh, uh, as a nation, a democratic nation, that we uh, support journalists to do their work. I think it's very important. And for that uh, case, we uh, not only more police capacity, but we have to uh, give priority to this matter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we cannot uh, uh, do uh, investigation to all the crimes that there are, but this is a specific group and we have to give priority. So yeah. I think that is important. Yeah, no, I, I hear you and I agree. Um, I, I do hear the need for prevention measures as well in your answer. Um, just to zoom in on one more practical um, uh, approach, which we were just discussing, this tailor-made protection. Uh, from a police point of view, um, do you expect to put this in practice more? Um, is that feasible, this recommendation from the, uh, from the report? Yeah, I think it's, it's good to, uh, to talk about it. Uh, we have this uh, single point of contact in every region. Uh, my colleague uh, Wim Honaut is also here and he talked uh, on a frequently base with the journalists. So what do you experience? What are the specific problems? And I think uh, uh, in the one region, it's, it's another case. Because uh, Paul, uh, yeah, he's, he's on the top level of threatening, uh, but uh, we're happy that uh, in the Netherlands, uh, luckily most journalists uh, don't experience that kind of threat. Uh, so it's important, uh, not only that single point of contact and the network, but it's also important that when you call the police, uh, uh, one... Uh, you feel protected or... Uh... Yeah, that every policeman uh, will act yeah. Uh, not only one uh, person uh, in the region, but every policeman, when you call the police, they act on a good way and they give priority. 
do you do you feel there's an urgency within the police to uh, that understands the role of journalists in society? Do you feel there's enough understanding in the police to? Uh, I think it can be better. It's okay. growing, but it can be better. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. I agree on that. There are still police stations where it's hard to uh, yeah to tell your story as a journalist. Yeah, not my story because that's. Uh, yeah. Not a spectrum, but the story of uh, Your uh, colleagues. a colleague being harassed uh, online and uh, uh, trying to, to discuss it and being sent away. Then, of course, we call pers veilig and uh, and we'll and we'll, we'll find our way. Yeah. But it should be more uh, in the roots of the police. Yeah. Do you feel pers veilig is is a a platform where there, which is serves as the basis for this dialogue, or do you feel that there needs to be? more invested in strengthening this dialogue between journalists and the police? I think Pers I'm looking at uh, any of you too. Yeah, want per, to, uh, Pers is, is a good brand, huh? yeah. so we have to uh, to keep that up, uh, not only for a few years, years as a project, but uh, uh, on long term, so that's important. But we have 65,000 uh, policemen, so yeah. we have to do more about the awareness uh, that uh, journalists are uh, threatened. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that the persvelig can be a good basis for for having these uh, contacts. That these and when be, because what you're explaining, of course, and I can and uh, I can understand it. I mean, when you have sixty thousand people working at a at an organization, you can't expect them all to be informed in the mm -hmm. right way. And that's the reason that these single points of contact are so important. So you can directly go to the to the the the, the better level to address the case when something goes wrong. And yeah. what we saw last year is also uh, because we have to, with the steering committee, we are, uh, well, every three, three months or something, we're checking on the, on the uh, also on the data, how, uh, what we get, get in uh, as, as, uh, as problems. And also the, the, uh, the reports at the police. And what we saw last year, which is good, is that there were, were almost uh, as much reports at the police as there were at Persveilig, which means that the the police found out, ha, have placed it in the right basket, so yeah, to yeah, say. Yeah. Because, Are following up on these. Yeah, yeah, so they recognize it as journalists going to uh, to the police station. Yeah. So this is so this is one of the things that comes out that yeah. is positive. Well, I mean, yeah, the, it underlines that that uh, Persveilig, of course, is. A best practice in the international context for a good reason. Um, it's good we have this base in the Netherlands. Uh, looking at the time, I'm going to look into the audience if there are any questions here. No, I see one coming in online, um, which is a follow-up question to all of you. Um, the Netherlands serves as a good practice. When advising other states on their measures to improve the safety of journalists, what, recommend, what recommendation would you give based on persveilig? So the way I hear that question is if other well, countries want to implement Pers Veilig, Yeah, yeah. Would, well, what, what I did, because the, uh, we have also, we're in good good contact with our European affiliates and, and, mm -hmm. and also, uh, for instance, Belgium was so inspired by what we're doing right here that they already uh, uh, made a step to uh, to put uh, persveilig.be online so so they're just starting it but what i advise them was you first have to start with a good research uh, yeah. among the journalists themselves because what ha we did so for several years and every six years or something we went to our, our members and we said we checked on them but the the, the big difference was uh, when brennigmeyer and odekerke in uh, back in 2019 really did a good research and then it, it was really put high on the agenda, also politically. So, mm -hmm. so I think if you want to start somewhere, you really have to have a re good research because you also make clear to your to the to the journalists themselves that they, as Rowan said before, that you should not take it for granted or something, but you should uh, speak out about it and and you should do something about it mm -hmm. and you should involve your uh, editors in chief and your the management in this. So yeah. I think training, research, and getting the the the, the managers involved is very important. Uh, yeah. Alongside with the police and and, uh, and yeah, good. Thank I you. think the and awareness other... is crucial. Uh, yeah. Awareness of the problem awareness. is crucial. Yeah. And and the horrible fact that uh, Peter Edevries has been killed last summer. Uh, the horrible horrible fact that 
uh, Martin Cock, crime blogger, has been uh, killed, and uh, the lawyer of a uh, crime witness and the brother of a crime witness, and uh, the newsrooms of the Telegraaf and Panorama have been attacked. Those horrible uh, facts uh, make uh, make sure that for one, two, three months, it's on top of everybody's minds, and then it fades away. Yeah. And that's uh, that should not happen. And uh, if I may state, uh, make one more statement, um, the courtrooms, uh, the extra secured courtrooms are uh, very well protected, but not for journalists uh, outside and not for lawyers of uh, uh, lawyers who need to go there. Um, and we, we tried to stress this uh, uh, for a long time. Uh, and now we uh, we got 10 email addresses of the 10 courts. But if we have any questions, we can email. That's not the solution oh. for this. <laughs> no, and is I, I'm going to look at pay. Is that something you want to uh, react to? Um, this need for but it's not only the police. It's not the problem no. of the police. Uh, yeah. No, that, that's but a my, reaction. Yeah, that's my statement. Uh, the first thing is that uh, hands off uh, the journalists. Uh, we must uh, uh, influence the public opinion. Yeah. You don't uh, attack journalists, and Prevention, then comes yeah. uh, the police huh? yeah. at the end. Yeah. And the, um, the populist politicians should stop poisoning the debate. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. In the atmosphere yeah. around This is, of course, the need, what's in the report as well, about this uh, prevention and this need for a culture shift to recognize the role of journalists in society. Um, I have one last question. Um, and then I think we have to round off because I'm not seeing any hands in the, uh, in the audience. Um, we've spoken about different measures to protect journalists, but what is the first priority now to improve the safety of journalists? According to Prime Recor Crime reporters, journalists, unions, and the police perspective. So everyone their own perspective. Uh, basically, what's the first priority in ter terms of protecting journalists at the moment? Tailor-made um, okay. uh, discussions. Yeah. Tailor-made, yeah. I think, of solutions. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think at the, at the moment where we are right now, I think we have to look at the prevention and, and we're looking forward at the report that was promised already for this spring mm -hmm. by the WODC. And okay. uh, in your report, I read that it's being postponed to next year or something. It's quite worrisome that because we also have to look at what can, can we do at prevention? What can we? What is the intention of people who are yeah. attacking journalists? And what can we do ourselves? So uh, I, I hope there's somebody from the Ministry of, uh, of Justice here uh, present. And we want to emphasize that this, uh, this, this research should be uh, available earlier than next year. Yeah, thank you. And Paye, last remark? Yeah, for me, uh, uh, aside of what is, has been said, I think uh, the network building, that's important. Yeah. So that we know each other and we can frequently talk about the experiences. Yeah. Good. Thank you with these last three concrete uh, recommendations. I think that's a good end note for this panel. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us here today. And everyone here uh, in the room as well, thank you for being here. Um, if there are no further questions, uh, I would like to round off and invite everyone for a drink at the bar after this. Thank you.